going to start our forum accessibility in education. On this occasion, we have six new educations in the field of accessibility who will be presenting and analyzing best practices to ensure and guarantee access to education in equal conditions to children and young people with disabilities. In this occasion, this session will be moderated by Ricardo Garcia Bamonde from Spain. And remember that during the sessions, you can send your questions in the questions and answers section to the right of your screen and give in your comments and send in your comments to interact with other participants. You can also follow us on social media zeroproject.com.org, in Twitter and Facebook, and use our hashtag, hashtag zerocom20. Ricardo, please uh, give you the floor so that we can share the different initiatives. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Carola. Um, welcome, everybody, to the session on accessibility in education. My name is Ricardo Garcia Bamonde. I'm consultant in accessibility and inclusion for uh, people with disabilities. And I've been working here in this area from 2004. I'm working on the ONCE Foundation in Spain uh, in different uh, inclusion projects for people with disabilities in general, blind people, always in the area of accessibility. I've also worked in uh, Latin America and the Near East, in Europe and in the US as well. I was uh, working for three years in the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia, in, in the university there, in a very beautiful program regarding education for universities. And now I'm here in Spain again, collaborating with different organizations like D3ACT, ITU, Zero Project. And well, I'm very thankful to be here and sharing this time with you all. And today we have a pan fantastic panel of uh, experts in education, and we are going to take different best practices that these organizations have implemented with the idea that everybody can benefit from these best practices, take the best ideas and try to apply uh, them in our own areas. And I'm going to show you some ideas, some preliminary ideas to start, and then uh, we'll give in the floor to the different experts, to the real experts, actually. Now, if you can go to the next slide. Right. And to start with, I would like to uh, in emphasize and uh, point out how important inclusive education is from all points of view, points of view, but especially with the commitment that countries have um, signed up with the United Nations Conventions for the Rights of People with Disabilities. That most countries that have signed this convention should have incorporated these into their own law corpus, legal corpus, but actually from the point of view of the future that is uh, in, uh, reflected in the goals of sustainable development, these commitments are commitments which we need to adhere to and work for. So the f uh, objective uh, goal number four, guaranteeing education inclusive education to all, all levels, at all levels. Uh, of course, from primary, secondary is the base of all the society, but also uh, what um, gives people the possibilities for their future lives and professional lives and personal lives is to be able to improve and to have good lives. So it's fundamental. Next slide, please. In this point, I want to comment that in this Millennium Goals, we explored a bit further, and it says clearly that educational centers or educational curriculum should be inclusive, inclusive 
to all the different vulnerable population uh, groups, including people with disabilities, um, so that they can access to the different educational levels. And for this, we need, of course, that the surroundings, the physical surroundings, and the virtual surroundings and the methodologies for teaching the students are also um, designed in such a way that can be used by all children, by all students, by all uh, people who need to access them without uh, any difference regarding their own conditions and incorporating all the perspectives and views than almost in 2021, we should all <clears throat> already understand gender aspects, for example, any ethnic aspect, LGBT, non-violence, and disabilities. We talk about these environmental things. This is a small uh, gender. <clears throat> we talk about all these topics, but disabilities uh, is still there a bit hidden. That's why it's so important that all these events have the visibility they are now having, because it is necessary really to include this uh, um, in inclusion for people with disabilities in a more visible way. Can we go to the next slide, please? Here, I'll stress the situation we are currently undergoing because the situation has put to the surface a series of circumstances that were already there underlying they didn't just uh, appear now with covid uh, pandemics but actually they did exist before but now they have been more vis uh, more visible now for example for example not only remote work, but education as well. At the beginning, when we had all the quarantines in the countries and hundreds and thousands, millions of children had to go home to study <coughs> from home. Well, those people who had enough means to be connected, telematic digital means, well, they have been able to do this, but that is not really valid for all the students, as we all know. There are many children who need certain specific support, specific aids because of their learning difficulties or disabilities. So not all those good and best practices developed are equally valid in all the countries. They depend on many aspects, depend on the level of development of the country, infrastructures, the means available. So in all these pandemics area, very good uh, ideas and best practices have appeared because of the need, right? Um, but I think that we really need to develop them further and develop more best practices in order to say, really, we can take this to this country and this other country. So actually, um, it's not only there in education. Next, please. But uh, this actually has an influence. I mean, all these access to education or inclusive education problems, not only in, during the pandemics, but in general, that had been with us for a, for a while now, they are affecting in other Millennium Goals. There is a diagram here I'm showing that is a very brief description to show that uh, the possibility to reduce inequality is directly affected by the capacity or not to be able to access inclusive education by all people, as we understand, them, and for very obvious reasons as well. So next, please. Coming, coming back to the situation of the COVID that we are experiencing now, lockdown, confinement, no lockdown, in many countries, we are seeing that some practices are more accessible than others. Not just because digital media are all accessible, that we know they are not. Not all the platforms are accessible and not all the contents are accessible. How many schools have subtitles, real-time subtitles, or 
captions or subtitle contents in educational uh, contents in didactic sequences given to children. Not all of them, very few actually. So those teachers, those support professionals that need to be by the children, because this is very complicated. Then, of course, this has to be taken into account and to continue working. Next, please. The implications that it has at the first level, we can say, well, the many children are not studying, cannot continue studies, and that is bad because all those deficiencies, lack of support, lack of access, what lead to is to think that these children may be at the risk of abandoning studies, drop out, drop out the studies, or actually, can they be reintegrated with this pandemic sense? Or then men, and then the impact in long term is in very important. And some invisible things as well, as not being with their um, with their peers, physically speaking, uh, we know that this is very important, especially at specific age. Next, please. So unfortunately, if we can do something to um, complement this, there is a risk that this digital gap and educational gap can be increased. Next. Then the, the problems that we have been detecting, lack of inclusion in, in education in different countries, this is even more stressed and it can become a step back, losing the progress they had taken, they had implemented. Next, please. And here I'm about to go. You need to uh, see what kind of measures are most important to learn so that this distance education forced and imposed on us and we hope it doesn't last much. We, we have to come that it will last. What we'll make it as accessible as possible. It's not so difficult, but we need to do it. It's a matter of sensitization and um, letting the educators, uh, uh, authorities and teachers, the way to do this. And uh, let them understand repercussions these can have in the development of any student, any, ch any child. And when this gets to normal again, coming back to a situation where we don't only go back to normal, but it's a better thing. So that all this situation can, and these difficulties can be overcome and everything that we have to invent to overcome uh, and to cope with all this could be for the better. And with all this said, I'll give the floor to the expert, to the panelists present, and well, I will give the floor to Michal Ramon, who will be presenting uh, initiatives developed by the organization that she's leading, Access Israel, in order to promote inclusive education and accessible education for young people and children with disabilities in Israel, and taking this to other countries as well. So, Micha, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very excited uh, to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, especially looking at my co-panelists. Uh, it is a great uh, honor and uh, I have no doubt that as always, I will use this opportunity also to learn more uh, because this is the whole idea, uh, learning more, sharing, and uh, without borders, making our world more accessible and inclusive. Um, are they going to put on the presentation, please? Um, so as uh, Ricardo introduced me, I'm Michal Rimon, I'm uh, the CEO of Access Israel. Uh, I'm not going to jinx it, so I always um, introduce myself as the proud CEO, proud of the achievements, the projects, but most of all the people that make Access Israel. Um, and I always say it, and I said it just now again. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, talk to you about a project that is very, very close to uh, my heart, and that is uh, Accessibility for Inclusive Education. Next slide, please. 
but just so you'll understand where we are coming from, uh, Access Israel was established 21 years ago uh, in an Israel that was not accessible, not inclusive. Um, uh, people, had, uh, people with disabilities had basically two options, stay at home or be picked up, picked down, um, led around a uh, very paternalistic uh, approach. Uh, that was the reality. And this is what uh, children saw. This is what uh, parents had to deal with. Um, and this is when Access Israel was established by Yuval Wagner and his friends. Uh, and the goal of Access Israel was uh, accessibility is the name, but it's not a goal. The goal is um, uh, really true inclusion, uh, improving the quality of life for people uh, with disabilities, all disabilities in all areas of life. Uh, and uh, we have been doing it in various uh, uh, methods, which I will touch in a second. Next slide, please. Now, um, next slide forward. In Israel, uh, as is in the rest of the world, you know, we're talking about the largest minority in the world. Uh, in Israel, we have about 18% people with disabilities. Uh, add to that 11% elderly. That is the accessibility crowd and add to that family, friends, uh, et cetera. We already have really uh, um, uh, a large portion of uh, society which is um, uh, which needs accessibility in order to be uh, included. Um, and this is the approach that Access Israel uh, came about. We didn't come from a begging point of view. We came from a point of view saying, guys, you cannot ignore it. You have to include. Next slide, please. Now, the way we do it, um, uh, at first, when we were established, there were no laws uh, uh, dealing with accessibility. And um, about 20 years ago, the first law, equality law for people with disability was, established, was legislated in Israel, uh, basically saying, guess what, guys? They have a right. People with disabilities have a right for equality and for um, uh, non-discrimination, et cetera. And later on, um, they were addressing accessibility and every ministry had to uh, set regulations in their ministry in order to make sure the fine tuning that uh, whatever is under uh, the control of that ministry will be uh, accessible, including the Ministry of Education. Unfortunately, it took them a little longer, uh, but about uh, a year and a half or almost two years ago, uh, new legislation in Israel uh, came about about inclusive education coming from not the disability of the child with the, with the disability, but rather from the needs what that child needs, how do we do it really customized uh, uh, accessibility uh, for those children. And by the way, also the parents with disabilities that are part of the school uh, atmosphere. Uh, the unique thing about Israel um, is that other than the law and the regulations, um, accessibility is a requirement for everyone, not only public bodies, but everybody who is providing service for the general public. Next, sli next slide, please. The uniqueness is that, first of all, the law has teeth, uh, and uh, we are now in these uh, last two, three years starting to see more and more lawsuits about this. Uh, we are doing accessibility on the country level, not only um, uh, the, the major cities. And a very unique thing that has a lot to do with the panel today is that in Israel, by law, it is mandatory for every service provider to undergo annual training on accessible service every single year. And once in the lifetime of the employee, um, I have to uh, uh, go through experiential experiences, which is something that Access Israel did before the legislation and it was adopted into the legislation in Israel. Um, um, next slide, please. So basically what that means, uh, first of all, we look at it as a marathon, not a sprint. We are looking long-term, we are uh, looking at it as something that um, uh, needs to change in the DNA of our uh, educational system. And, you know, I always uh, quote Whitney Houston, I believe the children are our future. This is where we should start in order to change the DNA of society. Inclusive education uh, is a must. Next slide, please. Now, um, you can pass on to a next slide. Thank you. We'll skip that, this one. Now, in order to achieve full accessibility, when Access Israel started and when the school system started uh, talking about, acce about accessibility, the focus at first was physical accessibility. How do we make sure that people with disability in general or the children can enter physically? But you know, uh, if you can click now, um, 
physical accessibility is great. Next slide, just click one more. Uh, physical accessibility is great because it paves the way. It enables you physically to get in. Another click. But the problem is it doesn't deal with what happens once you're in a building, once you come to the school. Next click. Then we have, in addition to the physical accessibility, the service accessibility. Uh, you know, again, making sure that schools not only are physically inclusive, but that the services provided by the school, you know, the, it's not only classes, it's also school breaks, it's ceremonies, it's trips, that everything will be accessible. Click, please. Now, service accessibility in Israel is very elaborate. The, the, the law, the regulation is very elaborate. It gives you the how-to instructions on how to uh, make sure that there is uh, accessibility. And it really gives you um, uh, a, a fine tuning on making sure that the services are accessible. Next click. The problem is, and here in the educational system, it's something that is very important. It doesn't necessarily change the DNA, as I mentioned before. It doesn't uh, change the way people look at each other, uh, look at people with disability, maybe talk to people with disability. It doesn't really eliminate the stigmas. And when we are talking inclusive education, one of the most important things is that breaking the stigmas, breaking the glass barriers. Uh, next click, please. And this is where uh, Access Israel uh, uh, methodology deals with the social accessibility. The social accessibility, next click. Sorry, I didn't know the clicks were, are not going to be uh, made by me. So uh, I'm saying the word click a lot. Uh, social accessibility, once you address that, you really are able to change the DNA of uh, the society, the class, the, the, the teacher, faculty, uh, et cetera. It really gives the difference, the change uh, in the way uh, people are uh, looking at other people who are maybe different from them. Um, I can tell you that in Israel, when I'm looking at the minus part of the social accessibility, this is not something that is mandatory by law. We always say that, you know, you can make all the laws you want in the world. You cannot make a law that you have to be a human being. That is not something we can legislate. So uh, we did have a lot of work on convincing schools, educational system, et cetera, to, to adopt this, to, to really uh, go into training, go into uh, activities that are going to create that social accessibility. But once schools started and uh, participated, I can tell you that the difference was amazing. Next click, next slide, please. Again, next slide. This will together create uh, uh, inclusion. Now, when you want to talk about inclusive education, you have to make sure you understand who are the players. The players are not necessarily only the students and the teachers, but it's everybody that is surrounding that inclusive education system. It is the parents, the same parents that in the afternoon are the ones who are deciding in many times who the child is going to invite or not invite home. And we have to remember, we are in a panel that is talking about inclusive education, but guys, the real goal here is not that the child will know or not know math better or worse. The goal for us is that in the afternoon, the child will choose to play with a child with a disability, not because the teacher said, but because they want to. That is the true inclusion. That is the true inclusive uh, education. So we have to remember that all players have to be part of the game. Next slide, please. Michal? Yeah? One, one minute. Okay. So you can pass on to the next slide. Now, how do we do that? Um, uh, again, a next slide. The way we do that uh, in Access Israel is basically uh, the four pillars, and we will, um, yeah, you can just click this on. The four pillars is the methodology that we use uh, to really create a change. The first thing is knowledge. When you don't know something, you're afraid of it. You don't want to come close to it. But once you know it, once knowledge is given, you really are less afraid uh, uh, to be in contact, to be together. Now. That is not enough because I can give great knowledge, but then you will always remember the last knowledgeable lecture you heard. So next click. The next pillar is the um, uh, experience. Or you know what, here it's the getting to know the person behind the disability. Now I can tell you a very, very short story, Ricardo, and then there's only two more points and, and I'm done. You know, in, in one of the classes that we uh, did this uh, activity, we saw that uh, there was a blind instructor 
that really enabled the kids to ask him questions, to talk to him, to really uh, understand who he is as a person. And he showed them all the gadget, the talking phone, the talking watch, the talking clicker that tells him the color of the clothes. And you know, all these gadgets were presented to the third grade kids. And then one kid raised their hand and said, excuse me, uh, how do you differentiate money? And before the instructor could answer, the other kids started yelling, what do you mean? He probably has talking money also. Because once you catch the kids in the right time, once you do it right, once you enable them to directly be in contact with people with disability, they don't see the poor, God, the poor person standing in front of them and they have to pity him. They see sometimes a superhero, somebody that has stuff that they and their parents do not have. And that changes perspective. But again, knowledge and getting to know the person is not enough. The experiences is very, very crucial. And because I don't want to take more time, uh, um, um, I will save it to one of the questions, hopefully, on how we do these experiences. And after we do that, we add the fourth pillar, which is tools to make a change. Whether you're a first grade student, a 12th grader, a teacher, or the president of Israel, once you do all this and you receive the tools to make a difference in your neck of the world, this will promote definitely inclusive education, not only in school, but also afternoon, changing the DNA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michal. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Michal. Y espectacular presentación. Thank you. Y... Incredible presentation. And, I, and, I, and I, I hear now about the all the progress and advances in Israel regarding accessibility to all levels. And thank you. And thanks to your uh, leadership. And I love the uh, social accessibility thing. Uh, well, and now we have to go to the next panelist, uh, Claudia Darnek, please. Uh, we'll talk from Brazil, leading a scholar the gente, because the work you're doing, please, to promote accessibility in education. So Claudia, please give you the floor. Let's all remember that we have 10 minutes, round 11. Let's go. Come on. Claudia, estás en silencio. Claudia, estás muted. I'm sorry. Buenas tardes. Les agradezco la invitación. Es Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be part of the first Zero Project Conference. I'm glad for myself. I'm an I'm an older woman, older than 60. One, I use glasses. I have a very short hair to the side with a cup front, gray. And next slide, please. The Standard Day Center Communication and Inclusion is the ONGI created 18 years ago. A strategy to guarantee the rights, uh, human rights from early childhood is the diversification in communication, accessible communication, inclusive communication. We're scholar the gente because we follow people and we don't admit any type of discrimination based on inequalities or differences. And also we are followers of the way where human beings express their own humanity. That's why we ask you, are you people? Do you feel like people? Do you perceive as people yourself? I believe you do so. I believe all of you are humans, and then you have necessarily the same value as a human being. Next, please. Human beings, value of human beings is different than the social value. Nothing can take human value from a human being on the opposite. Everything can, can be taken from social value. Social value of any human being decreases or increases along the life regarding their attitudes, more or less citizen, less. Uh, next. Before continuing, it is important to explain that I'm expressing in non-binary gender language using letter E so as not to assign women or men. 
and that is a transition, a necessary transition, and an inclusive decision and political decision. We said that all people here are human, and then everybody has the same human value. But where does the human value come from? From our own infinite diversity or from our similarities, which are finite? The Homo sapiens species is mixed without any logical order. Human beings are completely different between themselves. It's a manifestation non-binary by nature. A person was never born as another person, and this asymmetry increases along the life of a person because of different stimuli. So where does the human value come? for the human beings. I believe it comes from our own diversity. However, why do we have this impulse, uncontrollable impulse to organize diversity in categories that imprison the diversity? That impulse maybe is the main heritage from our own families that made us believe that yes, it is possible to make a hierarchy of human conditions, assigning them distinct values, human values. That mistake has been passed from generation to generation and society is used to consider, for example, that a girl with disabilities, intellectual disability, even when is treated with a lot of love is less valuable for the future of their family and nation, and nation that a girl considers as super intelligent. Judging humanity of human beings to attribute more or less human values is a very dangerous practice that is born from a false power that enables us to realize without reflecting other selections by exclusion. Does it make sense that humanity continue exercising that false power? Next, please. Communi accessible communication is the base of education, inclusive education. However, a school or out of the school, the most serious forms of discrimination occur in the process of communication each second, every moment that a presential face-to-face -face or virtual class does not offer sign language, subtitles, and audio description, at least. Discrimination by the absence of communication, accessible communication, atomizes and in, impedes the flow of information and dialogue intergenerational intergenerational generation and intrageneration is like a bomb that explodes from inside to outside reaching everybody breaking everybody into their own citizen integrity and then the new generations grow without an inclusion perception of themselves giving place to the perpetuation of these stigmas. We all know how, if, how we can discriminate people with disabilities, now. how difficult it is to discriminate, or how easy to discriminate. It is urgent to expand this criteria that form and uh, the national budgets to know how much is the cost of non-discriminating. In this case, characterizing the necessities of communication for people with disabilities will never be costly, but it is an investment for sustainability that cannot be postponed. Next, the right to communication is divided into two rights. First right is the right to communicate anything, pain, desire, contribution, debate, electoral debate by people with disabilities. The second right is to be communicated. For example, some signals to warn earthquakes are not useful for deaf people. Accessible communication must guarantee necessarily two rights. Next, Carola, one minute. Please. Okay. Are you talking to me? 
this is the trend of an inclusive communication. Inclusive education promotes the encounter of all types of communication from the early childhood, imitating the limiting the, the formation of prejudice and stigmas that no expression has more human value than the other Ex inclusive education inclusive school compromise commits the new generations with latin america that is inclusive democratic and sustainable to the public policies in education in distance education the totals, the question of the governments that could guarantee their commitment without being absolutely clear on their commitment, create, cre created an ambiguity. To todos, it's a word that was used in Brazil for this. In March this year, the information migrated to the online world without any accessibility of it. Not even the OS offered accessibility, who World Health Organization presented the inclusion in an inclusive way. And people living under the poverty line were at risk because the exclusion was exponentially multiplied in this tragedy. And our school created a hyper inclusive hyper connection project in order to access to information in the virtual world. In the project, Conquered Milestones in the Story of Brazilian Internet. Uh, April 2nd, we started the first online information for sign language audio description. On 22 June, we created a health childhood. I'm, I'm going to finish now. Inclusion is not magical. It demands an everyday effort because it's a systemic construction that necessarily it starts at school. Inclusive schools is the space where generations will meet and recognize as part of a human social place where they will be working coordinated to find solutions for those who were never solved by their own uh, ancestors like the violation of the rights of people with disabilities, the diversity of people. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Excellent. I like the how much does it cost not to discriminate people with disabilities? It's a very important question. Let's go to Diego Villarreal, Red Abyss. We a fantastic project to have. I've been watching this project for a while. Diego, please go ahead. Thank you, Ricardo. Well, I'm very happy to be here together with great professionals, and I hope we can have great alliances and partnerships and new projects. Hopefully, uh, more ideas and solutions towards a world that is more inclusive in education. Is it uh, my presentation there? Uh, no. Today, um, we're going to tell you uh, about two technologies we have been developing in the last um, eight or 10 years in Chile. One is called Transvox and the other is Visor, Visor, focused mainly on giving access to information and to communication to students with hearing disabilities and other disabilities I'm going to tell you. First of all, we are Redapis, we are a Chilean company, a social company, B company, that is certified as, certified as B company, one of the 3,000 companies around the world that is a B company. And our purpose is to enable and facilitate inclusion of people with disabilities in different contexts. Education is one of those contexts and mainly through two work of line, uh, line of works. One is development and operation of innovations in technology. And the other line of work is accompaniment and management of diversity or uh, inclusion and diversity with different institutions. 
We started this because one of our co-founders is a person with disability. And I want to show you a video. I'm going to describe because it's in silence and it shows uh, what a person with hearing disability experiences. This is a teacher entering the class. The teacher is talking, but you cannot understand. And the classmates laugh, except the person with hearing disability, with this really a uh, concern. While the teacher is still talking during the class, this person is uh, focused on a close up and she is there seen as very frustrated and basically her sadness and, and the, her frustration for not being included. And from this point of view, we wonder, can you go to the next slide, please? How can a person with hearing disabilities can uh, enter, stay and graduate from education? And we saw this move, this problem, we experienced this problem, and we started to see different information and data. And there's some information here. 460 million people deaf in the world, 830,000 in Chile, and of them, only 80% can access higher education, and only 3% of these people in Chile can graduate of a technical or professional uh, level compared with the 30% of people without disabilities that can obtain a grade. So we, we started to experiment this problem from a person with disabilities. So we say, okay, how can we handle, how can we manage, how can we solve this problem? And all the uh, innovations start from a very specific need or from a very specific opportunity to innovate and develop new solutions. So here, if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to show you the first technology we implement is called one of us. First technology that is, sorry, one more, Transvox. This is a workflow as it, as it works from left to right. In classrooms, teachers use microphones very similar as the ones they use in TV, and the audio of teachers travels to the computer of the student, and from the student's computer, there's a person in real time listening to this and writing in real time manually, and also with artificial intelligence assist, assisted. We can have any, many questions. And the text comes in real time, and at this point, there's around 50 people using this at the moment in different universities and school. One more, next. And the, the benefits and, and scope of the technology is, first of all, this technology was developed from people with disabilities. We help, of course, the technical, technological knowledge that uh, and enables people in class Besides reading the subtitle, they can take notes in real time. They, if there is more than one person, they can have several connected in the same transcription at the same time. And all the information, those text and audio, are kept in, an, in a place and stored so the students can retrieve the text with the family and the family can listen to the audio or the class to support the student. And also, this platform incorporates a dictionary so those people we work in, in the world of people with hearing disabilities, there is a difficulty and a, a lot of complexities in acquiring knowledge, uh, language, acquiring words. That's why the platform incorporates a vocabulary, a dictionary, sorry. It's being built with the students. And also, all the classes generate a great amount of information how long they have been connected, if they are using or not the platform, if we need to do some adjustments. And we share this with the institutions, uh, the universities, schools, foundations who are working with this and, and everything in real time. And so we can work together with a great uh, team in Redapis and the team who are in, in the institutions working with us. And I'm, show, I'm going to show you a couple of images, real images they are showing our students. There's a person with a computer in the classroom reading the text. Next, please. This is an image of a student 
she took this in the computer or the photograph it's separating what the uh, teacher said <clears throat> to the students next and these are photos of how this has been used in pandemics because many students who are at home and the teachers are at home too and the students connect to the online classes and they can see the transcript in real time let's go to the next one and i'm going to show you the other technology which is was this very similar to this previous one from left to right the flow teacher uses a microphone in the classroom a wireless microphone and this audio goes to a sign language interpreter that is at home or in our office or anywhere with access to internet and this interpreter listens in real time and interprets to the student through a specific device it can be computer tablet or mobile when he sees the information in real time and what are the benefits of this platform well first time uh, first of all the audiovisual uh, re record is stored so for a student with disabilities it's very difficult to take notes in, at the same time so we record this and the students can re um, re revisit the class the interpreting and the students are also asked how do you feel in each of your classes and we receive this feedback in the platform and we can do many things uh, together with the interpreters or with the students with the school with the teachers and as transbox this uh, technology records a lot of data and data is seen in real time as statistics of metrics that allow us to manage a better experience in the education of the students let's go to the images please I'm going to show real images shared by students. Here we can see a student in the computer uh, looking at the uh, sign language in real time and then this teacher. Next, this is another way where teachers, private teachers or supporting teachers for students with these disabilities, they get together with the um, deaf students with online sign interpreters being able to talk one-to-one -one with an interpreter in real time. Next. And this is the Visor platform where you can see one minute. OK. And there's the student and the interpreter in real time. And this is being recorded in the platform. So what measurements do we have? Next, please. We have been working seven, eight years in Chile. We have over 500 students supported with hearing disabilities. We have supported uh, students with uh, physical and visual disabilities. And we are working now in 25 universities, but we have supported over 50 so far. We have over 70,000 classes interpreted and uh, written. More than 100 students graduated. We have had the first deaf graduated um, lawyer and the first uh, guy with an MBA and we are going to Uruguay and, and, and we're going to other languages too. Next and to finish um, what are the successful factors first of all that we have worked from um, 2012 with people with disabilities in our team and the co-founder is a person with disabilities and we also have a very high performance uh, team, psychologists, sociologists, therapists, engineers, IT engineers, designers, and an administrative team that allows us to work in this way. Um, another important thing is that one of the things we are always worried about this is that this model is a sustainable model. Inclusion of technology is not free, has costs, and the costs are paid by schools, by universities, by institutes or foundations or the state but not the people with disabilities, not the families of people with disabilities. We have been worried that the development of software is very friendly, apart from being accessible, is friendly, but doesn't need to be boring or, or plain. So one of the things we worry is that in Bedapis, we have a department that is worried about management of quality for the services of both technologies where we make standardized practices we measure and we receive a lot of feedback from what is being sold or what is being 
uh, claimed by the students and the education institutions and everything that they tell us. We are working now, we, I'm going to finish. We are developing all these systems and uh, advancing in, in our uh, artificial intelligence and generating alliances and partnerships in Latin America. So I hope that from this first zero project, Latin America conference, we can get very good project and can still be a contribution for inclusive education. Thank you, Diego. Incredible project and very scalable, I think. Now, very quickly, we go to Kyle Duarte, Signs and Smiles. Please go ahead, Kyle. You're muted. Thank you very much. Can I have my slides up, please? Uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I am a, a Mexican-American male. Uh, I'm based in the United States and I'll be speaking English. Um, I'm also a sign language interpreter and uh, work with signs and smiles uh, throughout Latin America. As a, as a brief introduction to our organization, we were originally founded in Nicaragua uh, several years ago, uh, almost two decades ago. Um, and we have been working there ever since. So the project that I'm going to describe today uh, was started in Nicaragua, but you'll see that it has, um, that it has changed quite a bit since, uh, since its inception. Um, I, I'd like to draw on something that Michal very correctly pointed out in, in her talk uh, as she opened today, that children are, they learn not only in school, but also from their peers and especially in this project, uh, from their parents. And so our project is going to be focused on language learning uh, between deaf children and their parents. Now, it's very important to keep in mind that for deaf children, most often their parents are not deaf and are not users of sign language. Uh, and so we have set out to uh, bridge this divide in, in language use at home between children who are likely attending school in a signing environment um, or are, are basically deaf and need some sort of signing input and their parents who don't use sign language uh, and need to learn that. So, uh, so in brief, what we've done is we've come up with a smartphone app um, and this app has been designed with the, the design principles that you see here on the screen. Um, the first one is one of empathy. So in Nicaragua in particular, Particular, we understand that there is quite a bit of stigma around being a parent who has a child with disability, especially one who is deaf. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that parents are understood in, in a virtual environment, in an app environment, um, and to reach them where they are. Um, we know that technology use uh, is beginning to become more widespread in Nicaragua, um, but technology in particular is generally uh, very low level. Um, and so we have designed with those concepts in mind. Um, and we wanted to provide parents an understanding of what knowledge the world has about how it is that they can best raise a child with a disability, specifically a deaf child, because there is a lot of research that we can, we can draw on. Um, and unfortunately, in, in, in many ways, uh, some projects that are short-lived are not actually drawing on sound research about how children develop. And so because our team uh, is generally very interested in research, there's a lot of academics, uh, we have incorporated a bit of research into our project. And finally, we realized that as an organization that is largely um, based in the United States, we wanted to connect the users of our project with resources that are local to them. Um, not simply say that our uh, technology is the best and the only way that they can learn, but for them to be connected to the larger community. Uh, next slide, please. So quickly, I'll run through um, a couple of the features of the, um, of the app. Uh, we have a dictionary that has over 350 signs uh, that are age appropriate. So we're looking at uh, children from birth to the early years of preschool and kindergarten. Uh, so from birth to five and six. And we have filmed these signs in Nicaragua with uh, native users of Nicaraguan sign language. The dictionary entries also have um, audio 
uh, we realized that some of our parents might not be fully literate in, in, in even written English, or written Spanish rather. Um, so we do have audio descriptions and pictures as well. Next slide, please. Uh, we have an ebook. Um, this is actually a book uh, that was developed by the Chilean government, um, and it follows the story of a fictional family, but one that is probably much like the families that will use this app, where you have uh, two parents who have two children, one of whom is deaf, and the parents have uh, a number of discussions about how it is they feel that their child will ever fit into society and how they will learn basic concepts at school. Um, one of the parents says, well, if we get them hearing aids, then they'll magically be fixed and we won't have to provide anything else. And they, they go to different practitioners and learn that really providing as many resources to their child, including accessible language, uh, is going to be really what allows them to mature best as a deaf person in their world. Next slide, please. Uh, and the third uh, portion of the app that I referenced earlier are local resources. So we have a list of audiology clinics, schools that use sign language, um, the Ministry of Education, and local support groups, especially because we realize, again, that parents are uneasy about how it is that they will support their children. So we wanted to make sure that they have the resources necessary in their local jurisdictions in order to best support their children. Next slide. Uh, so very quickly, uh, with some early adoption, we did have uh, over 150 participants, Nicaraguan participants in our design process, uh, which meant that once we released the app, we were able to reach out. Uh, and we've, we've had three, 300 users on the, the Google Play Store. Um, of course, we feel that we can do better. So we need to figure out how it is that we can get the use of this app um, further along. Next slide. Um, the topic on everyone's mind now is, of course, COVID um, and how it is that we reach out to people safely. Um, another problem that we have come up with a specific, a very specific problem to being a US-based organization working in Nicaragua is that um, there's actually a law in US that no money that comes from the US government can be spent in Nicaragua. Um, and we uh, unfortunately get a lot of our funding from the government. Um, can we go back one slide, please? Uh, I think we've gone a bit too far. Um, so eh, podemos re perdón, eh, sorry, Kyle. Eh, podemos retroceder eso. Otra slide más para Kyle, por favor. No, retroceder. This one, yeah, challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, a big challenge of technology, as I mentioned before. Um, in Nicaragua, especially, there is not great access to high-speed internet. So we wanted to make sure that the uh, app was compatible with uh, a lot of um, inexpensive Android phones and that it could be used without an internet connection. Uh, Next slide. Just one minute left, please. Thank yeah, you. next slide. Uh, and so in response to this, uh, our organization, which used to be called Manos Unidas, which you may have seen us at Zero Project in Vienna, is now called Signs and Smiles. Um, we are focusing now on, develop, on, on using this app to uh, be a modular app that can be used for any combination of written and sign language. And so we are hoping to replicate this here in the United States, um, charge uh, download, uh, a download fee so that we can support development in other countries. And if you are joining us from a country in Latin America and would be interested in working with us to translate this into your country's sign language, we would love to hear from you. Um, so the last slide is my contact information, and you can reach out to me in that way. Amazing. Thank you, Kyle. Muchas gracias, Kyle. Excelente presentación y excelente proyecto en unos contextos, la verdad, la verdad es que bastante Thank complicado. Thank you, Kyle. Excellent presentation in a very complicated context has a lot of merit. Let's go to Pablo Lecuana. Diplo Nexus. Go ahead, Pablo, please. 
Ya no, sí. Buenos días o buenas tardes según donde estén. Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Well, I'm going to tell our experience of digital library offering access to reading material to people with visual disability around the world and also reflecting on some things on what happens with inclusive education in Latin America. Our work comes from the need of people with visual disabilities. In 1999, when we just started to have computers accessible and be able to digitalize material and printing material to be able to read it with a software that reads it the screen. We started the idea to create a digital library with for people with visual disabilities because this digitalization can give us fast access to reading material and we could put available different materials digitalized by different institu institutions and taking advantage of all the technology that allows us to think in a global level, not only at the local level. The library has grown beyond we could all imagine because it started like a small project and not only grew it as a library, but the impact of in people that could reach has been enormous. And also it was the specific pilot project to generate changes regarding copyright and access to uh, reading materials because the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities states must avoid that the copyrights are an, an, a barrier for accessing uh, reading materials for people with disabilities. I'm doing it very summarized in order to have uh, the idea of how the technology helped us to multiply and facilitate the access to materials and building the networks to access this library. Uh, we have access to over 65,000 different uh, books, titles for people around the world, not only for people with visual uh, disabilities, but also digital books, eases, um, the um, capacity to read for dyslexia, sufferers because they can hear the book uh, with a, and they this can improve comprehension and understanding for people with dyslexia and beyond the library the network of exchange of information and resources and experiences between the users and the institutions that access the library we have been focusing especially on education because in the case of people with vision disability, one of the main problems for inclusion in regular education is reading materials, especially in countries like Argentina, where educational systems uh, make it very complex to have accessible books for students. Because we have uh, we are um, we have a system where editorials publish different books for different subjects and grades. And each teacher in each classroom decides between 15, 30 books, which one will be used for the class. So we can have a hundred students in vis with visual uh, disability and, and have 15 different books to be adapted for the same grade for those students to be able to study and be in equal conditions with the classmates. So that the system already makes it complex and crashes with this idea of inclusive education. Sometimes we think that inclusive education, at least from our country, and I think in many countries of Latin America is the same. I think inclusive education means that girls with disabilities of any type are in, at the regular school, that's it. But being at the regular school without materials, without equal opportunities, without the necessary aids, or without the teachers having the right tools or training to work with the diversity, actually is an inclusion of numbers and not for results. And that's why our work as an institution, non-profit organization, um, has focused on generating the strategies, mechanisms, and networks so as to uh, achieve that books are in time and that children can study in equal conditions. That's why we have been 
coordinating with edit with publishers because when one book is generated in paper or one even digital versions um, there's always a book from a digital file from the publisher and if the publishing house give us that digital file the adaptation is easier and faster but it requires time time of people sitting at the computer although we are going we're going to books that need to have more illustration, different types of text, and everything needs to be organized in a way that is easy to navigate, easy to understand, needs to have description of graphical elements so that students with visual uh, disabilities can access the material. But unfortunately, the technology give us the opportunity to solve these problems uh, in the uh, partnerships with publishing houses, having the files in time, and people sitting adapting. This book can be available for children and having a library in a network where all the institutions can access this material can be easily get in the schools. But what is the main problem? Public policies. Public policies that, as Ricardo mentioned at the beginning, states are force they have mandatory commitments to include um, inclusion there's not real culture real visibility there are still things happening like the states do not assign in resources to inclusion we have been working 10 years with these accessible school books that should be funded had to be funded by private companies and donors of the beneficiaries or international cooperation and 10 years of showing that books can be made accessible, that children can have them at the same time that the other uh, peers and uh, to equal opportunities. Even this has not made the state, the nation to take this as a responsibility in their own hands. This happens in Argentina and I know this happens in other countries in Latin America. And a key example happens with pandemics accessing materials it was uh, difficult for uh, students with disabilities and in argentina after classes after classes started after two weeks classes started classes were suspended and everybody had to go home to study and the ministry of education generated a program called we still continue educating where where they started to produce materials text digitalized and paper text so that kids could be studied at home complemented with tv programs and radio programs but when the program started the first thing we did uh, we went to the ministry of education okay please let's see how to make this accessible we have the knowledge we have the experience we need to coordinate this we need to resources to access resources to do this and say oh that's so good that's so necessary that's so important but in face to the emergency and the urgency the ministry of education has different priorities we cannot put funds to you to this and this happens in many countries the idea of the extra cost that needs to be put for accessible things well we solve that later and that's what pamela said how much does it cost to discriminate or how much is it cost, does it cost not to discriminate that is to assign budget and create policies that enable and facilitate the uh, access even publishing houses to transfer the digital files or making accessible versions if the state buys the books as in brazil when the state buys the books and in their own buying purchases um, can include the obligation that the books bought in paper has an accessible version for students with visual disabilities but brazil is one of the few examples and it doesn't happen in other countries in latin america so because of our experience not only from uh, our work but with other organizations we work with because technology help us to do this to uh, to do a book in Argentina and be available in other countries and to be able to build on our experiences and resources. The technology gives us opportunities and we have lots of work to do, um, lots of work by small organizations that help uh, 
try to equal opportunities for students with disabilities. But if we cannot achieve the goal that the states make the needs visible, and if we think that people with disability are between 10 and 15 percent of population in a country, but policies, uh, educational policies, reading policies, inclusion policies are not test destining and allocating 10% of people, 10% of the budget to include people with disability, we are in the furnace, as the saying says here. Even if we make up all these networks, our efforts will be very good because it we have a good impact. We are a library that has a huge impact in Latin America. We facilitate students uh, work from primary, secondary, levels to have better opportunities. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to finish. But only can we cover uh, hardly with, with our resources, depending on the nation's international funding, which is rich less than 1% of people with disabilities in Latin America. The rest are invisible. They can't access to basic staff to guarantee their own inclusion. So I leave the question open here, the problem. Inclusion is nice in laws, is nice in goals, is nice to see in desks, but really, are we making the needs visible? Are we allocating resources for inclusion or the resources are they allocated in an efficient manner with the inclusion of people with disabilities to measure actually the real effect of the investment? Those are questions open and, and well, as the person uh, before me, I'm here willing to continue doing network. Uh, it's what we can do while we finally manage to change public policies. It's what we uh, can do, being efficient as we can and reach most people as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Very good. We go to our last uh, panelist, Pilar, please. Thank you, Ricardo. And in this very significant opportunity of dialogue and encounter, thanks to Fundación Descubreme that expands the mission of Zero Project for our world without barrier in the Spanish speaking community, especially in Latin America. This is a privilege for me to greet all of you without being subject to time and space limits. From now, from where you are, and whenever, whatever you are later on. Well, in the middle of uncertainties, the horizons for education are opening up, while asymmetries which have been chronic are revealed and new inequalities and violence emerge. In a very agitated way, challenges and answers appear regarding learning and participation methodologies and tools for education appear, but we don't have time to reflect on them and wait decisions about them. On the other side, and thinking of this invitation of Fundación Descubrimiento with the promise of the Agenda 2030 of not leaving anyone behind, as an echo, the second part resonates of this part promoting opportunities, learning opportunities along the whole life for everybody. Wow, as a moral imperative that doesn't admit any exclusions or exceptions. So it's not about focusing only in the educational system, but also looking beyond that. And we need to watch in retrospective in order to identify who were left behind and take note of who are out now and what are we going to do about that? Evidently, the young population and other population with intellectual disabilities associated to other disabilities and factors, poverty, violence, gender, health conditions, rurality, non-linguistic origins and along, etc. The current scenario has implied serious repercussions for the collective of students with disabilities 
at all at all levels from initial early education to university levels the principles of education uh, inclusion equity have faded the technology technology has not include the parameters for accessibility or information for these students we need to value the effort of the educational community especially teachers students and families to overcome this effort but we need to have a deep reflection that implies a call to action in order to break all these gaps regarding access to learning educational achievements and participation it's a difficult yes impossible no and from these reflections centering attention in those who were left behind in this accessibility forum in uh, accessibility education i will share the platform ludominga ludo from ludus synonymous of playful minga quechua minka and no tradition of community work in this slide that you're seeing now is a summary of what Ludominga means. But I will ask you that you go back first. Go back. There, yeah. Ludominga is one of the projects that won a national prize of funding for research uh, with resources of the Secretary of Higher Education Science, Technology and Innovation, Senesi. That means that it should be a product available for everybody in a free way developed by the Escuela Politecnica Nacional from Ecuador together with the Catholic University and University of Americas about to finish in March 2021. This framework is a supporting tool for developing acquisition recovery or strengthening of cognitive abilities, adaptive and labor employment uh, abilities. The project is being carried out regarding the case study by uh, he, by the target population being young people and other people with intellectual, severe intellectual dis disability associated to social psychosocial disabilities or low vision uh, as well as health factors we need for support and coming from homes of quintal one or two that means low or no access to uh, health and educational services the multiple intelligence pedagogical approach was taken into account the sociological uh, participative technology was taken into account in order to get information on the requirements of users in order to also create this functional mechanical um, playful uh, dynamics the platform ensures usability and accessibility for different users tutors therapists administrative or directors of the organization next the package for developing cognitive abilities is conformed by four groups. De los 20 mini videojuegos, Each of the 20 mini games works with different perspectives, space, shape, movement, speed, size, and color. Ludo Mundo is the second package. It presents micro games grouped in three scenarios, city, home, and employment. Has the goal of developing the structure abilities in adaptive behavior reinforces effort and intervention in order to answer difficulties because people with intellectual disabilities has not learned some behaviors or has not practiced certain behaviors interference and deficit both from the educational focus as an educational video game, it offers the users the possibility to learn to manage emotions, respond correctly in risk circumstances, control impulses, and solve problems. Next, the approach of the third video games group, multi-workshop multi for transition to 
work. It's planning center in a person, for example, bakery. But the trainer can modify the activities according to the functions and tasks that needs to train for training the employability profiles, taking into account the level and type of support required by the users as well as the needs of the company. Video games, prioritize, next please, prioritize the development of basic cognitive abilities, perception, attention, memory, reasoning, orientation, language building from the functionality of the efficiency, visual efficiency, that is using their vision and understanding what is seen by means of stimulus to be interpreted by progressive development. Next, please. In the design of Ludominga, next. Aspects like the following will be taken into account. Signification, causality, potential to coping, differentiation of emotion, self-care, among others. The um, inverted contrast helps the best contrast available to avoid instability of image and uh, some by the zoom, in, which increases the potential for accessibility. Accessibility is essential parameters. The, the 18 guidelines regarding intellectual capacities, intellectual disabilities were integrated and different digital ramps were integrated for increasing the accessibility of um, devices such as keyboard and mouse can help you configure the different uh, settings of the games and feedback is immediate. It helps to design intervention plans with different reports, analytics, and graphics to follow up by users or groups. Next, Pilar, about to finish. Yeah. The great challenges and the, our capacity to respond, we can create proposals based on evidence that the 4A criteria by the ECLAC Committee of United Nations accessibility, adaptability, and accessibility. Not least important is to support effectively the teachers in their own work that can expand and enhance a community that can create natural support networks. Inclusion, inspiration, and innovation. The three I's are also included. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Pilar. Excellent presentation. I don't know if we have any questions, uh, Carola, or we have time for last comments very briefly, maybe. I don't know, you tell me. I think let's leave the space for any person who wants to close, uh, do a closing remark, or you would like to do the closing remarks after listening to such good presentations. Concluding on these presentations, and then we go to our short that was uh, given to us by the Inter-American Bank of Development. Well, I wanted to say that all these projects seem to be really advanced and really based on a great knowledge and research um, and also has a scalability component, which is really interesting that I believe should be disseminated and an event like this should be able to do this collab should be able to create these collaborating networks in order to know more because we don't have that much time to know them not but at least to be able to go interest i mean if you're more interested to go deeper i think they could be very applicable or scalable at least adaptable to many countries i think so I don't know if anyone can make a comment in a very quick round, 15 seconds. We can do maybe, Carola, do you think? 15 seconds. Great, 15 seconds is a challenge, but I'll do my best. 
Um, um, first of all, um, as a proud ambassador for uh, Zero Project, I want to congratulate you, Carola, on really an amazing and interesting uh, uh, conference and panel. And uh, my, my best tip is Zero Project. Don't reinvent the wheel when the wheel is there. In various countries, in various cultures, sharing is the key. And I think that Zero Project in general and Zero Project Chile is a great example for that. Let's join hands, share, and that way we can make sure that not only inclusive education, but inclusion in general will be part of our lives and uh, we can go forward together, leaving no one behind. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Michal. Adelante, Claudia. Congratulations. Congratulations, Carola, Rubia, and todos, todos las personas aquí. Everybody here. Um, it's really very important for us, for us to change and for CEO to know all this work and talking to people that I feel really admire admiration for. Thank you very much. Diego. Well, I just want to reinforce that inclusion is built with all. And I think this is a very important time to transfer knowledge and work together with many organizations and professionals, which are very outstanding at Wellland. And I hope this instance helps us do it. And I think we can all be connected, not only in this space, but in all the sessions that have been developed in Zero Project yesterday and today. Thank you. Diego, Kyle. Uh, just a quick thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for the invitation to join this panel, uh, and we look forward to uh, connecting with these uh, panelists more and uh, with anyone in the audience who, who would like to. And congratulations again to Carola. Thank you, Carol. Muchísimas gracias. Pablo, adelante. Um, bueno. Well, very briefly, as we said, I think the key is networks not reinventing the wheel, but to sum up the wheels we all have to be going faster and to have present that participation of the people with disabilities is key on looking for the best solution. Great, thank you, Pablo. And finally, Pilar, go ahead, Pilar. Well, thank you very much for knowing that we can actually there's no uh, the causality and synchronicity. We have all synchronized, and we can be in contact in the future and multiply our possibilities. Thank you very much, Pilar. And then I also thank you all. Thank you all the panelists, and thank you to the interpreters, uh, sign language also. Thank you very much because they done a great job, and also thank you for. Um, you, Carola, to do this event, which is so incredible, and also your project. Thank you, too, for inviting me and for inviting us all. Thank you, Carola. Ricardo, eh, por haber, Thank you, Ricardo, for leading this group of very fabulous initiatives, as we have heard about. And definitely, uh, this is an incredible challenge, and I want to thank all for sharing this contribution, this part of your projects and programs that are doing and are carrying out at the moment. 